we've had a few glitches today. Our one of our speakers, uh, Julie Ia, is not able to be with us, but we're very fortunate to have Dr. Lucha Runcali here to talk to us about the survivors of the Cambodian genocide. Dr. Runcali was a family practitioner in Santa Rosa for many years, and she has a very interesting medical background. She has worked with Doctors Without Borders. She has traveled widely in Asia, particularly in Cambodia, and in Africa, where she has worked with victims of gendered genocide in the slums outside of Nairobi. She has been dedicated for many years to humanitarian assistance and has worked with many victims of trauma. She continues to work with survivors of torture who apply for asylum in the United States, and I believe Lucha was just doing that yesterday when we had urgent connections. One of the groups she has focused on for some time, as I said, is Cambodian genocide survivors and their daughters. So she joins us today to tell us of her very interesting experiences. Please welcome Dr. Runcali. Hey, is it okay? How's this? Can you hear me okay? It's on. Green light. Anybody hear me? Hello, hello. All right. The tech hurdle number one has been met and conquered. Um, so I want to tell you right off the bat, I like interaction. So go ahead, raise your hand, interrupt me. That's fine. We'll have a Q&A at the end as well. Um, and uh, I did, we, we had enormous changes at the last minute here, so you will see this is a bit rough. I had a day to put it together because we had a change of speaker. And, um, and so I ask your forbearance. Um, my hope and my intention here is to give you some feeling for the country of Cambodia for what people went through decades ago and for how it's played forward. Um, and there's a little bit of generalizing to other genocides because that's part of what you're doing in this course. So um, bear with me with, uh, um, with the bumps in the road with tech, but I think we'll just go for it here. So keeping with the theme of this year, which is survivors and rescuers. I, I want also, if you've got survivors, you've got to have healing on board. So I brought in that third element. Um, all right, so goals. I want you to have a sense for the genocide and for the years, the dates, that kind of thing. And then, because healing and what do you do afterwards? is such an important issue, um, we'll be weaving these themes of remembering justice, healing, and you gotta honor the extraordinary resilience of people who come through atrocity. It, um, I'm deeply inspired by the people that I work with, and um, I want you to be too. Um, so let's figure out where we are. Um, we're to the right of the screen, right? And all the way across the Pacific Ocean then, you can see Malaysia, the Philippines, and then China, and then what is rightly called Southeast Asia. India would be further left, and that's South Asia. And you can see this sort of cuddling up of Vietnam, Laos, Cambodia, 
and Thailand. And in the day, in the 18th century, all of that was called Assam. It was not divided into nation states. And there's a spectrum of cultures that have diversified from that original Assamese um, landmass and culture. So then zeroing in more on Cambodia, uh, you can see at five o'clock Phnom Penh, that is the capital city. And um, very, very interesting place to go. You can see that big lake in the middle, Ton Lai Sap. It is the lifeblood, uh, or it, it leads to the lifeblood of the country. And um, many, many fishers live on the lake with their families. And during the rainy season, the river flows backwards. So the lake empties into the river, and then the river empties into the lake. Very, very interesting. And then you can see, I mean, check out again the boundaries, right? You've got Vietnam on the right going to Laos to Thailand. And that's going to be really important historically. I also, before we head into atrocity in the 70s, it's really important to know that this was an extraordinary uh, civilization. Um, the picture here is of Angkor Wat. Um, it is a very large temple complex, and right now, actually, drones and satellite imaging are showing that this thing extends for many, many, many more miles than has already been excavated. And Angkor Wat and the associated temples were actually part of an irrigation complex that made use of rainfall, can built canals to carry water to nurture this extraordinarily rich agricultural country. Um, and the civilization was very sophisticated in terms of their hydraulic engineering, um, medicine, and over the years, starting around 900, um, with the development of Cambodian Buddhism. <coughs> so, going back again, like I say, early, early to the 1500s, you have this evolution of successive cultures that were not really messed with by Western civilization. Then in 1863, skipping over a lot of history, Nordum, uh, the, f the king at the time, made an agreement with France that uh, Cambodia would be a protectorate. And France had colonized actually quite a bit, um, including Vietnam and parts of Thailand. So Cambodia agreed to come under the French umbrella as part of French Indochina. And all through that area, you can still buy baguettes. And uh, you can still see people on bikes with an occasional beret, although they aren't terribly practical for the sun. Um, then, again, skipping lots of history going forward to World War II, um, the Japanese came in and occupied. But they said to the French, well, you've got a pretty good administration, so we'll let you just keep on being the bureaucrats here and administering. And then at the end of the war, France said, OK, good enough, besides which Japan, you got defeated, so we're going to reclaim our protectorate over Cambodia and all of Indochina. Um, and then a few years later, the son of the king, Prince Sihanouk, negotiated with the French. It wasn't a violent overthrow, but he negotiated independence. And bear in mind, this is happening all over the world in the 20th century. You have nationalist independent movements in Africa and Asia. And this is an early part of that movement. Um, and he took it over and named it the Kingdom of Cambodia. And then 
between 53 and 65, we have the development of the Vietnam War with US involvement starting around 1960. It wasn't really publicized. It was secret alliances with the French. But the big fear was that Sihanouk actually um, created a socialist state. He wanted centralized banking, centralized health care, et cetera, et cetera. And many countries who were like the little creatures caught between fighting elephants chose to be non-aligned. The non-aligned movement, including Castro in Cuba, the idea was, I'm not going to pick an elephant because the other elephant's going to step on me. Let me pursue an independent course. Let me have good relations with both of the big elephants, i.e. the US and its allies, and Russia, China, North Vietnam. However, um, well, I'm getting ahead of myself, all right. So then, uh, in 65, um, remember we've got North Vietnam just hugging right up to Northeast Cambodia. And these are nation state boundaries that aren't really ethnic boundaries. Um, and the North Vietnamese began crossing the nation state boundary into um, Cambodia. Um, there was a very famous, basically, footpath between North and South Vietnam called the Ho Chi Minh Trail that was a supply route. And part of the Ho Chi Minh Trail looped into Cambodia. Um, this ultimately was unacceptable to the US. There was the domino theory that if you let one country in a re region become communist, then everybody else was going to, and then they were going to affiliate with our enemies, and then all would be lost. So that was the mindset of that period of time. And between 65 and 70, among other things, uh, the US overthrew Sihanouk's government. He fled to China and we basically put a puppet named Lon Nol into place. Now, also starting in the 60s, we started bombing Cambodia. Again, the um, rationale being that the Ho Chi Minh Trail was continuing into Ham Cambodia. So look at this. 113, almost 114,000 sites were bombed. Uh, over 230,000 sorties, planes loaded with bombs going out. 230,000. Um, over 2 million tons, almost 3 million tons of landmines or bombs or whatever. And Nixon's rationale when he came into office was we got to wipe out these North Vietnamese sanctuaries. We bombed twice as much in Cambodia as we did in North Vietnam. Half a million dead, which at that point was 5% of the population. And there was a Republican from California, Pete McCloskey, went in 75 to look at this. And he said, this is a greater evil than we have done to any country in the world, and wholly without reason, except for our benefit to fight against the Vietnamese. He was horrified. This is a Republican, right? We had a Republican in office, and he was absolutely aghast. And I want to point out, this is very immediate. We have several hundred Cambodian families who live in Sonoma County, and there are several people here who survived those bombings. One of them lost a husband, one of them lost an infant, one got renamed Lucky because her parents lost six of their seven children and she survived. Um, and every once in a while, I, so I should also tell you, um, I mostly, I have a lot of debt because I went to med school late. So I work as a hospitalist, but I also run a clinic group 
for Cambodian survivors of the genocide. And I've done that now for eight or nine years, and we meet every Monday. And um, I, you know, they know that I know the context. Um, and every once in a while, I'll bring up the bombing and I'll say, you know, I'm so ashamed and we did a wrong thing. And you can just feel the relief in the room. First off, that there's an American that knows about it. And secondly, that there's an American who's willing to distance herself from the national policy and apologize, and I do, I bow, and I say I'm deeply, deeply sorry. And also you can appreciate for them, well, the US came and plucked them out of the ones who are here, the refugee camps. And they are very aware of having a better life than their relatives who are still in Cambodia. So that comes up too. It's a very complicated existential thread. So here you go. Whoops, wait a minute. I didn't want that. That's what I want. So every one of those pink dots represents a bombing raid. Check it out. Look at that. Every single one of them. That's the 230,000 sorties over camp. We never declared war. This was part of the Vietnamese war. So um, it's important to know, look at the bottom point, there's still five million landmines in the ground in Cambodia. Farmers dig them up, kids find them, so they get blown up. They lose an arm and a leg, they get killed. And um, um, there is this landmine museum that I went to, was very, very moved by, I'll show you some pictures. And um, besides, displaying what a landmine looks like. I certainly didn't know what it looked like before I started studying this stuff. Um, they, they house and shelter survivors of landmine attacks who don't have any place else to go. When I was there, there were about 50 of all ages, from little kids to older. Um, and you'll see in a minute, um, some of these folks get become skilled craftspeople they take the shrapnel and the, the scraps of metal and they make jewelry. Um, Did I miss that? All right, I'm, I hope that I'm gonna find landmine pictures and if I don't, we're gonna figure it out. So we had Lan Mo come in in 70, 75, the Khmer. So Khmer is another way of saying Cambodian. Um, and it looks like Khmer. And the way Cambodians say it is Khmer. And there you go, they're a French protectorate, so you've got the French word for red. So the red Cambodians, Khmer Rouge, came in, took over Phnom Penh. There had been, as you can imagine, with the bombing and the countryside, there was a lot of unrest and a lot of anti-American feeling for this government that we had set up. And the Khmer Rouge were able to capitalize on that and eventually to take Phnom Penh in 75, renamed the country Kampuchea, and then again in 76, Democratic Kampuchea. Okay, so hang on, I have to figure myself out because I want you to see the Landmine Museum pictures. Um, let me see what happened. Yeah, here they are. I just didn't get them in the right order. So. Let me figure out here. I gotta go back up. Oopsie. Yeah, right? There you go. So this is the walkway into the museum. <laughs> These are four foot bombs and landmines. And kids play around this stuff. Oops, sorry. Yeah, there she is. And they have a fish pond. It's built in a sort of horseshoe shape. And there's koi and very lovely tranquil pond. And then there's this 360 display of various kinds. Military word for this is ordnance. 
there's various kinds of landmines or ordnance. And UXO is unexploded ordnance. It's the live landmines that are in the fields. So these have been picked up, defused, and put on display for the museum. And um, part of what I found very moving was the display of the prosthetics, you know, the fake limbs that survivors get fitted with in a country with little resource. And yeah, this is the anti-landmine group that eventually got the Nobel Prize for creating an international treaty against landmines. So landmine awareness should not cost an arm and a leg, right? <laughs> okay. <coughs> and I mentioned that some of the survivors who live in the Landmine Museum have become exquisitely skilled craftspeople. So talk about beating swords into plowshares. You're gonna take uh, cast off weaponry and turn it into beautiful jewelry to be worn by men and women. I'm out of, I, I bought lots of pieces and have given it all away. Otherwise I'd have some to pass around to you. I find it one example of, okay, your country got bombed. It got carpet bombed, in fact. 5% of the population died. Many people are still getting maimed. And what are you gonna do? Well, you're gonna have a place that displays this stuff, creates ongoing awareness. You're gonna take care of the survivors, and you're gonna keep the whole operation afloat, not only with NGO money, but with beautiful craft. So. It's an example of healing and resiliency that you will see playing through over and over again. Okay, now I gotta go find myself. All right, let's go back. Um, yeah, I think that's where I was, actually. Am I getting there? Oh yeah, you got it, okay. So here comes the Khmer Rouge. Their leader was a man that we say in English, Paul Pot, Cambodians say Popo. So you hear talk about Popo Khmer Rouge. That is Paul Pot and the Khmer Rouge. Um, and also around this time, starting in the 60s, I mean, it's, Cambodia is a little piece of world history going on, and it's very much connected to these other things that were going on, other movements in other countries. And in China, Mao Zedong, towards the end of his life, decided that the revolution wasn't moving fast enough. He wanted his legacy to be more impressive. He wanted to create a great leap forward, bigger than the first great leap forward in the 50s, and he wanted to make sure that the entire country was peasants and that peasants could show the world how amazing they were. So he overthrew intellectuals, sent intellectuals down to the country to learn what it's like to actually do physical labor. Popo came in and said, oh, I'm gonna do one better. I'm gonna set up, uh, I'm gonna do it even better than Mao Zedong did. And Mao died around the time that Pol Pot came to power and so the torch sort of carried. So the Khmer Rouge, first off, they emptied the cities. Secondly, anybody who seemed to have an education was a fair target. If you wore glasses, you could be eliminated. If you could read, if you held a position as a doctor, a teacher, a, you know, a bureaucrat, anything that required literacy, and participation in the previous order of government, you were, you were dubbed uh, an old person, old people, to be thrown over so that society could become uh, ruled by the new people. So the cities were quite violently emptied and, um, and many people were killed in one way or another. Just as you'll learn in Rwanda, there was a debate about whether it was worth it to use bullets 
people were killed in a variety of ways that did not include bullets. And one of the things that happens if you eliminate the literate sector of society, people who have studied survivorship from atrocity, they look at what's called protective features. So in general, if you've learned to read, that's a protective feature. If you were loved in your family of origin, protective meaning you're probably going to do better even if you've come through horror and so forth down the line. Well, when you take out education and you take out the infrastructure that runs a country, then who's left are people that probably have not learned to, to read. And for me, with my group of Cambodians, that's in general true. Um, there are exceptions. And some, most of them don't speak English, and most of them have English-speaking kids that they can't talk to because the kids don't speak Khmer, and they don't speak English. Um, it's very, very poignant to me. OK. So and then just as Mao did in China, there were re-education camps. Um, we were, I was working in an individual session with one of the survivors. And there was a tree that we were looking at. It reminded her of a beautiful pagoda. And then the image flipped on her. She said, oh, I got locked in the pagoda at midnight after all day working. And then we had to do re-education. I don't want to think about that pagoda. So we went back to the focus on the tree as something that was beautiful. OK, so I mentioned uh, not only forced migration, but the whole calendar got reoriented. So forget about this ancient civilization. We're starting right now, 1975, with year zero. And uh, Anchor, I showed you Anchor Wat, this beautiful representation of an ancient civilization that's a touchstone for all Cambodians. It's such a source of pride and affection. So then Anchor became the Ankar. And kids were separated from their parents and told that Ankar was now the new parent. And that probably their parents were old people, old people, not the new people. And that therefore, Ankar would appreciate if they would spy on their parents and tell Ankar if their parents were reading or if their parents were stealing food for the children. And, uh, and then the kids were, the intention was to completely create a new society by separating kids from the parents who would have the stories of what it used to be like. There were also forced marriages in several of my Cambodian women, the women in my group, um, have been through that. They have very complicated lives where they've got kids from first four forced marriages, kids from the Lon Knoll area, their love marriages, and kids from what happened when they came to the US. Um, OK. And also, you'll see, they took, so Cambodia has been centered on Buddhism for centuries. And Angkor took traditional Buddhist concepts and kind of put a different spin on them. OK. So they said, oh, you're t way too individualistic. Because in fact, the Buddhism in Cambodia is the oldest strand of Buddhism. And it is focused on individual salvation, as opposed to the Buddhism in China and Japan, which cultivates your own enlightenment for the good of all beings. Um, and that's a kind of um, dodgy division because the women that I know and love are very happy to extend loving kindness to all beings, that this is not foreign to them. But, but Khmer Rouge said, all right, too much individual, uh, the monastery is otherworldly, doesn't care about building good housing, putting in development, um, doesn't really care about tolerance for like peasants, um, not true. And um, the hardship 
in the monastery doesn't do anything useful, whereas the hardship that we're going to give you for forced labor and little food is going to actually create this new society that's going to be good for everybody. So thousands of temples destroyed, monks killed, with only 500 left. And again, remembering the society was centered on Buddhism. All right, so if you look at, this thing ended basically January of 79, so April of 75 to January of 79. Um, 20 to 40 percent of the population gone. It's hard to get figures on this. There wasn't good census to begin with, but they're extrapolating from mass graves and from survivor stories. So many were evacuated from the cities to the countryside. Others died of disease, starvation, and uh, forced labor. And then there was a hierarchy of who got killed. And as often happens, Pol Pot, as went forward, became very paranoid. That happened to Mao. It's happened to other strongmen, dictators. They begin to feel that the people that they were trusting are no longer trustworthy and want to grab power. And so even eventually Khmer Rouge um, workers began to be targeted. And um, yeah, we've talked about that. All right, so then um, this is controversial. <laughs> um, there's a long history of a bit of tension between Cambodia and Vietnam. Vietnam is more of a Chinese Confucian culture. Cambodia is more Assamese Buddhist, very different cultural flavors. Um, and for what it's worth, the Vietnamese got rid of Khmer Rouge and uh, the official domination of that party. Um, and Po Po went out into the jungles almost to Thailand. He died a year later. Um, and so the Vietnamese called the country the People's Republic of Kampuchea. And then there was a lot of pushback over 10 years with the Cambodians saying, well, you know, thanks, but why don't you go home? And so then uh, the Vietnamese withdrew. Cambodians came in and again named it the state of Cambodia. Um, and forwarding again another roughly 10 years. Khmer Rouge, who were still around, put Popo on trial, sentenced him to life imprisonment. Now, they aren't the government at this point, but they said, you screwed up, buddy. And then um, he, out in this jungle, he died. He was a very sick and broken man at the end of his life in hiding and his funeral pyre was trash and old tires. Um, so he, uh, you can still travel to where he last lived and died. Um, and there are some who actually still miss him and appreciate him. Yeah. I think, the, so the question is, were the Khmer Rouge trying to gain favor or status by putting Popo on? on trial. And I think that's a fair question. Um, and I think you've probably got a soup of mis -mo mixed motivations from anger at the brothers and sisters and spouses that got murdered to wanting to, to recognizing that's probably not a good idea to alienate the Western elephant altogether. Yeah. Um, all right, so in that time, we have survivors, starting from the late 70s, going to refugee camps in Thailand. I didn't have time to give you a map, but there were several large, large refugee camps. Tens of thousands of people migrated uh, into Thailand. The Thais had mixed feeling about that. There's one famous massacre where 10,000 Cambodians were herded over a cliff to their death. But the UN was there. At the time, in the humanitarian world, the big thing was local leadership. So being misattuned, they put the Khmer Rouge in charge of many of the camps. 
And so a lot of the atrocities continued. There was sexual slavery. There was extortion for grain and the food distribution. There was still the beating and torture. Um, and much later, the UN recognized what had gone wrong. So sanctuary was partial at best. So, all right, let's look at, this is a US, this is published in the Journal of the American Medical Association. So this is looking at who made it to the US. People also were repatriated into France, especially, um, and a little bit into the UK. Um, near death from starvation, 99%. Slave labor, 96%. Friends or family murdered, 90%. Speaking of motivations for wanting Popo out of power or on trial, um, and then you go down, uh, torture 54%, and then all of these um, other atrocities. And then, where do refugees come in the US? They come into poor, usually n urban neighborhoods. So they inherit the poverty and the violence that we haven't fixed here. And it's a very, and when you come in already traumatized and you don't speak the language, this is, and you have no idea of how to get social services or protection or how to interact with the schools, et cetera, et cetera, it becomes really complicated. Okay. And again, looking, this is public health um, uh, survey um, which started in Thailand. There was a Harvard psychiatrist who did the first mental health, public health surveys, and then it's continued going forward. So 62% of PTSD. That's actually quite remarkable that 90, what, 90, or, sorry, 30 some percent don't have PTSD. That's an important thing to remember. And the PTSD is a real deal and then 50% are depressed, and it goes on. So there's a cultural thing called sleep paralysis, where people cannot move and they see a ghost figure that is on their chest uh, that is holding them down. And it's a PTSD nightmare cultural phenomenon. Um, and then the ones who are at risk for this kind of stuff are poor, older, don't speak English, and unemployed because they don't speak English. And when I first started gathering my group together, many women had not come out of their house, out of their room in the house for years. And several, there were waves of immigration into Sonoma County, mostly in the 80s. That's a long time to not come out of your room. All right, so you have this mess. What does it take to make things better? I think that's a really important question, and that's going to be a question for all of the genocides. You've got Rwanda coming up, and what, um, Yugoslavia, you have a couple, yeah, yeah. So you're coming into the 90s and later, and this is a really big question. How do you make things better? So I'm working off of a framework of a man that I'm gonna introduce you to named Yup Chang. He isolated these three things, justice, memory slash education, you can't just bury it, and then healing. And healing, my experience is you have to work, yes, you have to work on the social level. You also have to work within communities at the small group level. And there is a place for individual work because saving face is actually a value in Cambodian culture. So I can work in the group to a certain degree, but then there are things that don't get shared in the group because, oh, they're gonna think bad of me and they're gonna talk and then my, by implication, I'm gonna die. So there is a place actually to work with individuals. Oops, I'll keep going through that. Um, 
I'm, again, we'll come back to that thread. Um, in post atrocity societies, I'm including South Africa, which didn't per se have a genocide, but certainly had apartheid and similar levels of violence. The question comes, how do you remember this? And how do you remember this in a way that honors the survivors, recognizes the complexity of a split society where at the very least you've got kids of the perpetrators, and in many cases you've got perpetrators that are still here. What are you gonna do? So many, many countries have had to grapple with this. In Cambodia, one of the, the I'll show you a couple of monuments. I already showed you the Landmine Museum. Um, this is Chang Ik, it's called the Killing Fields. It was indeed outside of um, Phnom Penh and many thousands of people were killed, were massacred there. So there's a memorial, and the glass in there shows cases that are full of skulls that were dug up in the surrounding area. So it's a very soaring architecture with all the symbolism, the Buddhist symbolism of the layers of the cosmos and the connectedness to the ultimate divine and it's housing the bones of the people who were killed there. All right, so here you go on the right, you're looking at what is signed on the left. 450 people were killed and buried there. It's an example of a mass grave, just a pile of dirt. But you can see the ribbons on the bamboo stakes around that's people coming there to remember relatives or to remember community members. And you have a spectrum of people who say, ah, oh, I never want to go back there again. And people who say, no, 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 my ancestors are in that dirt. I need to come and I need to remember them. All right, uh, this is hard. You can close your eyes, plug your ears. Babies were taken by the heels and smashed against the trees very, very often. So the rest of that sign says this was the killing tree for the babies, and you can see all the memorial bracelets that have been hung on that tree. And <laughs> it's there, all of Cam or much of Cambodia is river delta. I showed you Tomle Sap, that big lake, and then Phnom Penh is south of that, and it becomes this delta of a million braids of river. And so the soil is un unstable, and then you get monsoon rains. The 50 years ago, the bones are still coming up. They come up with every rain. And so they are, there's places where the bones and also the clothing comes up. These things are gathered and remembered and then you can walk around the grounds and there's a very meditative pathway. It's, and people go and they sit and it's understood that if you're on one of these benches, you're not really up for chit chat. You're just there to be. Mm -hmm. And here's another one, I'm not going into it, but there was a grade school, again, with this tendency of genocide to take the institutions of normal society and turn them on their head. So instead of a place to educate young people, this became a place to re-educate the old people through torture. And it's a museum and you can go through it. There are many pictures of the victims and so forth. Here we go. This is who I wanted you to meet. I think he should be up for a Nobel Peace Prize, and I hope he gets it. His name is Yuk Chang. Um, he survived. He, I think, was 17, 18, 19. He was a med student at the beginning. Um, he lost uh, family members in very gruesome ways. He hid out, took off his glasses, and faked a country dialect, and he survived. And when the Vietnamese came in, there were shoe boxes and shoe boxes of documents and photos, and the Vietnamese were gonna just 
toss them all out. It was all junk, right? And Chung s practically single-handedly said, no, 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 no. And so he founded, he worked with money partly from the UN and then in collaboration with Yale's Center for the Study of Genocide to create the Documentation Center of Cambodia, DC Cambodia. And it's in Phnom Penh. And um, I'll show you in a minute. Yeah, okay, look, 600,000 pages of documents maps of 20,000 of those mass graves, like I just showed you at the killing fields. Chung has put that together. Um, and 4,000 interviews with previous Khmer Rouge officials or functionaries who were willing to talk. Um, one of the things that I think he recognized is the tremendous cultural value in Cambodian society of no, 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 we're just going to put that aside. Um, Cambodian, like most languages, doesn't have a word for genocide, doesn't have a word for torture. And the word for torture includes now the new word that came, was brought up, the word for karma. So by implication, if you were tortured, what kind of a crummy person were you in your previous life that you got this kind of karma to go through the genocide and be tortured? You don't really want to talk about that. And if you're poor, uneducated, elderly, and you come into the US, and all of a sudden you've got these American socialized kids who are like loud, and they think youth is the best thing, and they can't talk your language, you don't feel really empowered or capable as a parent, and so <laughs> you aren't really going to tell them about your crummy karma. And in any case, you might not have the language. So many, many of the second generation kids here have, they know kind of there was a genocide. They have no idea that their folks were in it, and we'll return to that. <coughs> okay, yeah, you got that. Okay, so Chang laid out, what does it take? You gotta have memory education, you gotta have justice. So in 2006, the ECCC, Extraordinary Chambers of the Court of Cambodia, got set up with a bunch of money from the UN and the US, and 11 years and $300 million later, they had three convictions. Um, Popo by then, as you know, was dead, so he couldn't be put on trial. But his four hench people were the first ones to go through, and one of them was too demented to be tried. The aunt, four hench people, one of them was too demented, one of them died. And then in addition, the guy who ran that grade school that became a torture center and a murder center, he was put on trial, and he was actually the first conviction. But that's what it took, 11 years, 300 million, uh, and three convictions to get there. Now bear in mind, if you are gonna have a, a tribunal like this, you gotta have survivors who are willing and able to testify. So people who have been through this kind of trauma, the act of telling the story again brings it all online, all over again. So you gotta have a cadre of local religious, preferably Cambodian-speaking psychologists, psychiatrists, support people, just to get witnesses to come forward. And then, I didn't say, but in 78, once the Vietnamese came in and then very quickly came out, 78, 79, a Khmer Rouge official, Hung Sun Ren, came into power and he's still in power. So how much does he want this to happen? Not a whole lot, but he's getting foreign aid, so he's gotta look like he cooperates. So there's gonna be foot dragging to actually get this thing to start. 2006, Khmer Rouge left in 1979. Look at that. It was really, really, really hard to get this going. And many people feel like, eh, too little, too late. Not worth it to think about the past. Yuk Chang says, we are doing this for the future, and indeed there's a lot of research across the world, South America, South Africa, 
societies that bury their memories of genocide and torture do much worse as societies, whether you're looking at economic measures or looking at public health or looking at tendencies to repeat this. So there's big price for burying it under the rug. Okay, and here's Chung again, the uncompromising lens of justice and the command of law is a necessary step towards healing. He's not gonna pretend that this fixes everything and it really doesn't. And you'll learn more about that with these other societies. But it's a step. And it's a big difference if it doesn't get taken. Okay, so I think, yeah, okay, I'll, I'll after this one. Um, so, but check it out now, coming up, you're gonna deal with Rwanda and I think Eastern Europe, right? No, okay. So there were tribunals and look, Rwanda took 20 years, Yugoslavia 23 years, we just said 11 years in Cambodia. 83 convictions in Yugoslavia, 61 in Rwanda. Then there were acquittals. But check it out, greater than two billion dollars or three to four billion for those two. In Cambodia, we're talking about hundreds of millions. This is really expensive. And that's an important thing to know, especially if you're thinking about international aid. Most of these societies can't come up with this in the wake of devastation. It takes the international community. All right, now, let me see. Well, let me see where I am. Go down. Yeah, okay. I'm gonna show you a picture uh, Yuk Chang has started an institute in Phnom Penh on the grounds of the Documentation Center. Um, and look at the architecture of that structure. He got the same, oh no, it's not the same woman, but he got a woman who's very, very well known for memorial architecture, internationally known. Zaha Hadid, Iranian woman, who's died died of a heart attack in the last year or two. Think of Angkor Wat and this immense structure and these soaring towers. And look at the transposition of this institute. And the words in Cambodians like rit mean the fragile paper papyrus that used to be the paper in the old days that things were written on. And that's what many of the documents that Chang saved were made of. So he managed to take these crumbling documents, digitize them, and create an archive. But then there's also a structure that's gonna be part of a tripartite school, archive, and anti-genocide center. I'm, um, again, keeping going, and I'm relying on you to keep the thread with my somewhat jumbled s mix of slides. So um, I mentioned the archives. He's formed a school in that complex for the study of genocide con conflict and human rights. And the idea is to prevent, learn, learn what are the preventive factors here, and have scholars and money to put towards that. And then also, in the interests of justice, both research on crimes against humanity, but also preventively sustainable development. If people are not starving and unhappy, they're a lot less likely to be vulnerable to um, extreme solutions, such as the Khmer Rouge offered in Cambodia. Um, yeah, okay. So I'll show you, that's, that's all based in Cambodia, and my first slide here, I talked about the diaspora. You know, Cambodians scattered after the genocide. And so I want you to see a really remarkable thing that's going on in Long Beach by a young woman who's a survivor. Her name is... I know her by her Cambodian name as 
Monique Sum. She, her American name is Linda, uh, sorry, Laura McMillan. And um, she and I traveled in Cambodia together. She is an extraordinary woman. Um, and she started uh, a center called the May Center. Let me see if I can show you her. Nope, I let it go. But what I can do is go back here on the site and let's see if I can show you. There's a little three minute video that talks about what they're doing there. So I have to find it and I apologize that I didn't have it right, right away. But M-A-Y-E stands for meditation, uh, agriculture, yoga, and education. Um, and those are the four prongs of her program. It's really, really beautiful. I want the video. There we go. So three minutes. All right, so what do you notice just from that little clip? What stands out for you? You notice a happiness, yeah. And sadness, that's right. You know, in the big studies on refugees across the world, um, the number one thing that doesn't get counted in the PTSD usual mental health metric, homesickness. That's a number one thing that people experience. So you're seeing that layered on top of loss of family. And then what it means to have these plants that you haven't seen for a long, long time. And you saw the surround, right? This is a poor neighborhood in Long Beach. But um, this little center has become a neighborhood gathering place. Anybody else? Yeah. Right. That is, that's a really big issue. Now bear in mind, people who had gone to school got killed. So many, you know, I. <laughs> I have um, quite a challenge sometimes when I want to speak to my group and I really want people to listen because there's no model for being in school. So there's no model for taking turns one at a time. And after 10 years, I've kind of come up with little signs and there are members of the group who will say, no, 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 we want to hear Dr. Lucia. What does she have to say? Um, but there's also, you have many of these people had head trauma. I've written many, many waivers for the citizenship exam for US citizenship because I want them to have social services. And I recognize that between PTSD and in fact, how many bangs on the head, and I go through and I count in order to write these reports. At 60 years of age, it, it's, it's, um, I want to offer English to those who are motivated, and I do, and we have a slow, here's the, you know, the word for shoulder, and now you can say to your doctor, my shoulder hurts. People want that kind of English. But it's a huge thing, and if you're gonna design a refugee program, get people going on English ASAP. It's huge. So, anything else strike you? Yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's true. So many of the men were recruited and killed. Um, I don't know actually what the demographics are. I, my group is actually mandated for women because of the sexist structure of the culture and because I wanted to create a safe space where women could talk. Um, but there were many, many men killed. And Rwanda, you'll learn, <laughs> basically came out with a female society 